Welcome back. Yeah, welcome. Hope you had a good break. We had a great lunch mm -hmm. out on the terrace. Yeah, in the sunshine. Oh, it was lovely. The, the Seattle... Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. it wasn't like that. It was All right. nice. But yeah. it was good. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was right. wondering, if, is there any good way to segue from the last session that you did? Uh, well, funnily enough, there may be. Oh, and, good. Yes. I was so hoping... We were talking about in-app purchase, yeah. sort of monetization. Where would we do that? Where would we do that? So, uh, obviously, all around this is kind of the store. So, oh. and apps and stores. This is what this next one is about. So, uh, we've actually kind of, um, as far as Phone 8 is concerned, you've... Uh, We've been through the uh, the new APIs, and there's still a lot of new tools to show you, a lot of great stuff. And we've got the Enterprise Story coming up after this. Yep. Um, and uh, a great session on web dev for the great browser we've got in the end. And, uh, of course, there's the topic of uh, building for both Windows Phone 8 and Windows 8 from the same code base. So that's what we've Hot got on. Topic. We've got that for you this, uh, for the, the last section of this training. It's going to be a fun afternoon. And we're going to start with a... Good look at the the whole Windows Phone store and how you submit apps and uh, how that all works. They want to know. They do. I want to know. know. So uh, part of this is going to be saying, okay, well, how do you get your app ready for submission to the store? How do you make sure that you know you've got your best chance of uh, uh, your app being ready and getting it in there to the store and uh, in good shape and hopefully sail through the submission process? Um, we're going to look at what you submit, how you, can, how you build your submission package, um, the distribution options for your application, uh, the actual process of submitting it and the testing that goes on, uh, some other things about uh, monetization, talking about advertising, and some tips, top tips on actually how you can uh, maximize the uptake of your application. So first of all, we've created our app, we've built in all these great features that we've shown you, and uh, we want to actually do some performance analysis. So there's some great tools uh, in the SDK for doing analysis of your application. So if you're in testing and you're getting some feedback that it's sluggish, you know, you're not getting good performance, uh, you may need to drill down in a little bit. And there is some tool called the, uh, uh, the Windows Phone Application Analysis Tool, which will, uh, uh, gives you some uh, good advice on, uh, on optimizing your, uh, your application. And you find this on the debug uh, menu. It has a number of different settings. This, um, it, this, this tool actually turned up uh, in the 7.1 SDK, but in those days there was just the profiling, the execution and memory profiling. But now there's the monitoring uh, um, tools as well, which have been added to this. Um, and I'll show you in a moment how you run that and the kind of information you get out of it. But th this is a first. This is actually some of the tests that they do are around the responsiveness, the startup time, and that kind of stuff. So you've, we've actually got a lot of um, tools now for automating those tests and allows you to do some testing of your app before you even get to the submission stage to make sure that it's in good shape. And you get really deep, de detailed uh, data out of this. Uh, so uh, the analysis provides plenty of good quality data, uh, and you can drill down and focus on, on memory or execution speed as well with, the, uh, with the, the detailed analysis thing. So let's have a look at what that looks like. Uh, I've got a, um, a Rob Miles production from what Rob Miles Incorporated, an application called Thrasher. So clearly that's, uh, that's setting the scene for, for the kind of thing it's going to do. Uh, now then... When you pro first of all, you'll notice at the top I'm in release mode. You can only run these uh, these performance tools in release mode. So on the ironically on the debug menu now we can start Windows Phone application analysis. This is kicking off the analysis tools. Here are the three options. Um, we'll come back to this one, the monitoring one. But I'm going to actually do uh, the profiling so that you can profile for an execution. Application performance, you get great visual and code profiling feedback. Or you can add, um, profile looking uh, primarily at memory usage. So if you, if you think you've got, a, you know, if you've got a very memory intensive app and you're worried about the memory usage, then you can, uh, you can select that one and get great, great uh, feedback on how it's behaving. So I'm going to select the execution one. And then hit this link here, Start Session, App will start. You'll notice that we've, we're selecting the emulator at the moment, so we're not, this is not a great test because uh, emulator performance is not the same as a phone. But it's running now. Uh, I'm going to go for Find That uh, Emulator. Here we go. This is the app is running. And while it's running, we're gathering information. Uh, I've got two options on this. You can play with this. But uh, I'm actually going to, uh, to choose the... Uh, uh, I'm going to tap the, uh, the memory thrash button. 
So you'll see that it will, there's a message starting and it's doing some obviously memory thrashing and then we've got done. So it's done some, some real work there in this application. So now we can actually go and have a look at what data has been gathered for that. So we'll end the session. The app, of course, will exit, and then it's going to copy all the data back uh, onto the desktop, and then you get this graph where you can look at the, what's been going on. Um, you can see we've got um, frame rates. This is for graphics. We have, this is what you saw. This is another example of superb graphical engineering. Uh, very little graphics stuff going on, so the frame rate isn't really relevant. But if you have rich graphics, that might be important data. CPU usage. So you can see a lot going on at the start while the thing is starting on. App responsiveness is good. There's nothing really that's uh, stopping that from, uh, uh, from running well. And look, you can actually monitor things like battery consumption. So you can have a look at how much, what the uh, predicted battery drain would be while your app is going through a particular part of your, uh, uh, your functionality. Um, and memory usage, storyboards. Storyboards are something that triggers animations. Uh, down at the bottom, we've got something called uh, GC events, garbage collector events. And then we can just go along the timeline. Now, remember, I wasn't doing anything for ages. And then finally, we got to the point where I, uh, S is a storyboard. So actually, that's when I clicked the button. And it, the storyboard there would have been the animation in the button, the, the way it changed to uh, indicate that uh, it had been clicked. And then all of a sudden, this is where the memory thrash stuff going on. You see all these GC events? These are garbage collector events. Now, the garbage collector runs um, whenever um, a, a high number, I forget the number, 100,000 objects have been created or something. In, in root, so it routinely triggers every now and again. But if you see a very high frequency of GC events going off like this, this means that this application has been creating loads and loads of redundant memory objects. So uh, we can, uh, you know, all this information is in there. Um, uh, external events, that's when I click the button. Input gesture tap if I hover over it. So we can, we can dig a bit deeper into this and uh, just select a timeline and uh, figure out what was going on in there. So now we've selected that range. I'm going to scroll this up. And now we can start drilling down. You'll see that when I selected it, select it, you get uh, high CPU usage by managed threads. It's warning us that there's, uh, this, is what, this is the sort of thing you need to investigate. Excessive allocations. Uh, total memory allocations increased by 20.82%. Uh, so uh, it says you could cre consider rerunning with a memory profiler, but actually we're going to get good drill down anyway. I'm going to drill down on the CPU usage. And this is now showing us uh, that the, uh, it's allocating by thread. And one thread in particular, this one, uh, has taken over 45% of the CPU time. There's being a dual core processor in this phone, of course, so that's pretty much all of one processor running flat out. We can drill down further into the uh, functions. Now it's drilling down in that area, and uh, we can actually see, uh, let's pull that back, uh, all the samples. And you can see the, ex the, the samples that are, are being, uh, that are being uh, included in that. And uh, that uh, one particular uh, high thread, has, one particular uh, method has been highlighted. We can link and go straight into the code. And surprise, surprise, here we find the culprit. This is what, uh, we, when we click that button, the uh, functionality that we executed, there was a there's a loop in there for i equals 0 to 5,000. Okay. Uh, we made a random number size buffer. We allocated a buffer of that size. Uh, then we sort of moved through it, and we added. Uh, we're sort of doing also these memory things and removed that. So we're doing loads of memory allocations. And we did that 5,000 times, and then we, we, did the, uh, we quit out of that. So that was the, uh, that was the code, and it's, it's led us down that path to identifying uh, the culprit that caused that bad, that bad performance. Right, so that was a quick look at the... Uh, there's, I mean, it's, it's a very, very detailed uh, perf uh, tool set, so uh, there's some good uh, documentation on the dev.windowsphone.com that uh, tell you all the information you can get out of that thing. But if, if you want to do real fine level analysis of uh, memory allocation, CPU usage, and that sort of thing, this is, this is your friend. This is another new tool. We've touched on this. Actually, I meant to use this in the networking thing because one of the real nice things on the uh, simulation dashboard is that you can run with uh, your emulator and simulate running over a slow network. So uh, that, that's a really good way of uh, showing the effect of um, 
uh, the benefit of compressing your data and, and using compression on the wire. Because uh, if you uh, you can simulate running it over a 4G uh, cellular network or running it all over Wi-Fi or indeed over a 2G, very, very slow network. And you can really see the benefit of, uh, of compressing your data and do, keeping your data transfers really small. Um, so that's also available on the uh, on there as well. Uh, this is the uh, UI for simulating the uh, net, the poor network performance. You have to check that checkbox and then and then restart the app and uh, then it will it will uh, take it. So you can't change it dynamically. So you have to run it under that uh, network simulation uh, conditions. That's really useful as well. Right. First of all, now let's dig deep into what it is you ship. So we've been working in Visual Studio. Uh, and working with solutions and projects. And we haven't really talked about, you know, what we are running. Uh, we, we talk about, we have mentioned those different folders right back when we were talking about um, the local folder and the uh, application folder, which is when the, uh, when the application gets in, downloaded onto the phone, this is where it gets exploded and all the content files, images or anything else that you've put in your project as content, this is where they get, uh, get placed. But how does it get there? What's the packaging thing? Well, the answer is a zap file is actually where what the uh, is the distributable package that you send, and this is a declarative manifest-based installation, and uh, uh, it's it's got a digital signature. It's tied to your developer identity, um, and also you can sign these by an enterprise for enterprise deployment. But the zap file is the uh, is the container that you ship around, and everything gets compiled into it. What is a zap file? Ah, actually, it's a zip file. It's just a zip file with a different extension. So you could rename uh, your zap file to a .zip and open it with uh, any compressed folder tools. Um, and some, some third-party tools uh, that you can, uh, you can choose to install will actually open up a zap and know already that it's a zip file. And what do you get in it? Well, this is a very, very simple. This is the Thrasher. You get the Thrasher.dll. That is actually the compiled output of the application. You get the uh, there's an app manifest XAML file and an WM app manifest XML document. And then also then there are folders for any assets. So these are the, this is the content of the application, such as um, icons and graphic files and that kind of stuff. That's what you get in it. So those two files, well, no, this is the XAML file. Uh, this one, you don't actually have to uh, change. It's just built for you when you create a solution. Um, it's down in the properties folder. Uh, and you generally don't have to change that. It just identifies the components in the zap file. This one, of course, we have touched a number of times. All those extensions that we're editing have gone into that. Um, and, uh, and the GUI editor uh, is the primary way of editing this file. But for certain these other things, like all these extensions for, um, uh, for uh, file associations, for protocol associations, that kind of stuff, all, all that has been, you have to hand edit that. And we've seen that under, over the last day or so. You have to make sure that the uh, the stuff that you request is accurate. Now, first of all, th what sort of thing is in this app manifest? You get the, the, the GUI allows you to um, allocate the app icon and the resolutions that you support. Um, we have already saw the, uh, yesterday about setting your primary tile template. That's all controlled through this UI. And so this is where you need to put your application display name and a good description. And this, this stuff all ends up in the description on the store as well and in the, uh, in the Windows Store app. So you need to make sure that you take trouble to get that right. And that's where the navigation page, the initial default launch page of your application is. This is where you set your app icon. That needs to be 300 by 300 in Windows Phone 8. This is a PNG file, which is also included uh, into the zap file for the application. And if you make your, the background of your app icon, uh, if you make that transparent rather than a solid color, then the, the users, uh, you'll, you'll get the, the user's accent color. So you'll blend, take the same tile color as a lot of the first party apps as in the background of your, your app icon. Then you need to set the supported resolutions. Uh, usually you'll select, check all three, but if there's a particular reason why you can't run on a 720p, for example, then you can uncheck that and it will not be offered, the app will not be offered to users of those phones when they go into the Marketplace app. This is the default tile options. Uh, we looked at this yesterday. So um, there's one 
good point there is that the tile title, what gets written onto the tile, is always displayed in white onto the tile. So you do need to make sure that your, when you're designing your tile, the images you supply for the background, uh, if it's a, um, if it's a, like a, uh, the one of the ones with the uh, where you're supplying background images, make sure you've got contrast there so you can read that name. And then you've got to actually set up the, you allocate the images that you're going to use. Tile sizes, we looked at this. Uh, these are the, uh, uh, for those different, uh, the flip and cycle tiles and for the iconic ones. Uh, these are the images you need to supply. This is the full capabilities list. So uh, th this is a bit of a difference from Windows Phone 7. So in Windows Phone 7, it didn't really matter whether you got the capabilities right or not. You'd submit it up to the store and they would use reflection on it as part of the submission process and basically set the right number of uh, capabilities uh, that you needed. And that was kind of starting to break down a little bit because some of the later phones had like front-facing cameras and you had to go in and actually um, uh, hard code the, uh, the XML manifest and add additional things if you wanted to use things like that. Uh, but now the full list of capabilities is shown there, but you have to go in and check the ones that you need. This is now a manual thing. There's no automatic setting of these that we used to have. And if you uh, try and run an application and try and access one of the APIs that's, that's linked to some of the resources, you'll get an exception when, at runtime when it tries to use that particular resource. So if you don't check the, uh, the camera yeah, and you try and use it, then you get an exception. There's also um, there's a section called hardware requirements. Now, these, you don't check these if you optionally use them. You need to check these if you have an absolute requirement for them because what this is used is to filter it, the uh, pres presentation of your app in the store application. If, uh, if the user of a phone, if you say if you check NFC and you, your application absolutely needs NFC, and it, otherwise it won't operate, if you check NFC and then uh, a phone, uh, somebody on a phone that hasn't got NFC tries to download that application, then, uh, then well, they won't even see that application when they're, they're browsing the store. It won't be there because it's used to filter the ones that are shown in the listings. So this is ones that are absolutely required by your application, not ones that you might optionally use. Uh, this is something else that you uh, set in the manifest. Now, the, the memory caps have changed in Windows Phone 8. So uh, the working memory uh, in Windows Phone 7, what it was was that you you tended to work to keeping your memory usage below 90 megs with Windows Phone 7. And if you went over 90 megs on a, what was the lower spec devices in those days, a 256 meg device, uh, then the OS would kill your app. If you were on a 512 meg device, which was the high-end phones under Windows Phone 7, uh, you would be allowed to uh, grow up to uh, sort of over 120 or more. And it's, it was a bit of a soft limit. It was kind of dependent on, on what other apps were, were being cached in memory and, and, the, and how much was going on with first-party apps. So it was a slightly sort of a soft limit. There are now hard limits in Windows Phone 8. You have to make sure that your application doesn't exceed these values. Now, what you get by default is you get the min cap line, depending on your application state, so if you're a, uh, if you're a XAML based app and you're running on a 512 to, in the range of 512 to 768 meg device, that, which are now the low end devices on Windows Phone 8, your memory cap is 150 megs. And, that's, and if you go over that, the OS will kill your app. On the high end devices, one gig devices, then you are, the memory cap then becomes 300 megabytes for a XAML based app. And you can see for XNA games or for native C++ apps, the memory cap on both is just 500, is 150 megs. So that's what you get by default is the minimum cap. That max cap, you can request it uh, if you like. And the way you do that is you have to go in and hard code your uh, WMAP manifest. You have to go in with an XML editor and edit the WMAP manifest and put that bit of XML at the bottom and in the functional capabilities, functional capability name ID func cap extend mem. There's two. Uh, so extend mem uh, means that you can still run on the, the low end devices. It will install on all devices, but you're always going to get the max cap memory allocation instead of the default min cap. So that's 180 on the low end devices or 380 on the one gig devices. 
If you set the ID Rec Memory 300, then then your app will not be offered to the low end devices, the 512 or 768 meg megabyte devices. So it won't. It, we filtered out in the Windows Phone Store and will not be not installed onto those devices. But you'll get on, uh, it, on, it will still be offered for, for installation on one gig devices and you'll get the min cap as normal. So those are the two options you can use for adjusting your memory threshold. So you just have to ask for these things if you uh, have strange uh, additional memory requirements. Right, now, the next useful tool I'm going to talk about is the store test kit. So when the application is submitted up to the Windows Phone store, there's a load of tests that are, be, that are done on it by the uh, store team. The store test kit allows you to actually perform all those exact same tests on your application before you submit it. So if you submit it up to the store and it fails, the turnaround can be sort of five business days. So here you can actually save yourself a lot of time if you actually run it through the store test kit yourself before you even get to the submission stage. And the test kit checks a lot of aspects of the submission, checks you've got all the right required images and also itemizes all the manual tests and runs some automatic tests as well. So it gives you, uh, it's, this is a great tool to give to your QA department, which is probably you with a different, with a hat on it that says QA on the front. Uh, and uh, it allows you to, uh, to, to uh, check that you're going to pass the, uh, the, the submission process. Uh, this is the UI. Uh, it te checks you have to register all the artwork that you need to submit because there's quite a lot of artwork requirements when you submit an app up. Um, because the store apps apps in the store appear both on a web interface and obviously in the market the in the Windows Phone Store application on the phone. So there's artwork required for that, uh, and obviously it's in your interest to show people what the app looks like, show screenshots so that you can persuade people to buy your app. Um, you need to supply a store tile, which is a 300, 300 pixel image that is used on your page for your app in the store app. And then you've got to supply at least one screenshot for each of the display resolutions that your application supports. Uh, you can, you're only required to enter one, but it's a really good idea to go to town on this and put, make it supply quite a few, because the more screenshots you can show, the more that you're showing to your potential purchasers uh, what your application looks like when they're using it. And this is a very powerful way of persuading people to choose your app and uh, pay the money to install it. So uh, how can you get screenshots? The, uh, one of the tools in the emulator uh, can grab a screenshot. That's a good way of doing it. Um, but just just remember this, please. You, I, uh, I'm surprised I haven't had the question, or maybe we have. I haven't had time to follow <laughs> all of the questions. But uh, there's a sm small line of small numbers you see a lot up, running up the top right-hand side of the screen in the emulator. These are sort of frame rate counters, are very uh, of great interest to um, to hardcore graphical designers who are doing really fancy graphics on the phone or like games and that sort of thing. You can check the frame rate and this sort of thing. So, these are the frame rate counters, so you can see in real time what, how your display is refreshing, whether it's, uh, it's missing frames and that sort of thing. And these are shown by default. Uh, if you look in your app.xaml.cs, you will find this code if debugger is attached, but it's not, it's, by default it's set to application at current host settings, enable frame counter is set to true, which is why you see those little numbers. And it's amazing how you do still see screenshots in the uh, Windows Phone store with those numbers up the side. So just please turn it off before you uh, get some screenshots. So then it, you have an option to run all the automated tests. So it, it actually runs part of the application analysis tool as well. And I'll show you that in a moment. And you run through all these tests and you get pass or fail. So you, you can immediately find out in advance rather than wait for the few days it will take uh, when you submit it up to the store. You can actually do these tests yourself and fix any problems that you find. The application analysis, kind of touched on this before, uh, does the analysis on the app. So let's show you what that looks like. Uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, going to open up uh, another application. So a thing called a bad app. This is the bad app. Which is, this app is bad to the bone, it says. There you go. So uh, this is the, obviously the, a manifest editor. So uh, I'm going to go into, uh, to, uh, to uh, run the, uh, uh, the test kit. Oh, it's on the project. Here we go. Project menu, open store test kit. 
Now just notice, what, uh, I don't know if it'll do it actually, because this is my system. Oh yeah, there we go. Store test cases have been updated, so this is really good. So this is showing you that actually this is a living thing, so it's not just, you know, you get this thing when you install the SDK and then it goes out of date, because they do change the tests that they're doing. The test kit, the automated test kit that they're running uh, when you submit your app up, uh, that does change. Um, and this is connected to uh, a repository, so when they change the test cases that they're using, uh, you can update your, your copy in the store test kit as well. So I'm going to update that now. It's going to uh, uh, upload them, and it says close and restore, restart the store test kit. So let's just do that. Oh, there we go. Now, um, I have, uh, this is the application details. You need to specify the store tile. There we, we've done that. You need to give it a screen, well, screenshot. You've got to give it one at least for each resolution, and then optional ones. Uh, and uh, so there's the, there's the artwork. And once you've done all that, and that's what you're going to have to submit with your app. So it makes sense to, to do it at this stage and keep it in, a, in, in folders in your folder. And then we can run the test. So we'll run the test cases and the initial static test. Uh, we have got two that have passed. First of all, it validates how big the zap file is, because there is a threshold for that, um, and that the content files are good. There's nothing illegal in there. Uh, it's validated the application icons, and yes, we've passed that. We failed on the screenshots. What is this? Validation of screenshots. Uh, no screenshot was specified for 720p. At least one screenshot must be specified, it says. OK, so we failed one of those tests. So actually, what I'm going to do is simply go in and change this, and. Uh, uh, normally you'd supply that screenshot, but I'm just going to uncheck that. Um, build it again. Release build. Uh, go back and we can run our uh, store test kit again. We'll run them again. And of course this time we've passed those automated tests. There are more tests of course, that's not all of it. And we can now start the Windows Phone application analysis. This is the top option. We, we did the execution profiling before. Now we're going to do the monitoring. So this will start the session. Um, and the application will start, bad app, it's collecting data. Uh, this time, we just kind of, you just need to sort of execute, ex exercise the app. Uh, oh, look, it's got a uh, camera thing going around here. And then it's got a big button here and then if it's, that has the text on it that says, bad things happen here. So when you press the bad things happen here, I imagine bad things will happen. So let's just try it. Hmm. Yeah, well, so the bad thing is that it actually doesn't seem to do it. Well, who knows? Doing bad stuff. Here we go. Oh, well, we actually, oh, I did it lots of times. Maybe we got a crash there. But it's already picked up on, uh, there was a problem. We, did, we weren't seeing the screen there, but actually there was a really slow startup of this app. The app startup time was too slow. Responsiveness was poor. Uh, if you did the profile monitoring, you could have seen some of this stuff as well. There was no data, no uh, networking with this. Battery charge, it checks that as well. This is a part of the automated testing, checks that the battery usage is not excessive. Um, it checks your memory threshold, that's very low, 15.79 megs, uh, and the average memory used. Uh, but in the, we've got two alerts, two things that are going to have to be fixed before we submit this app. So then you could go and run the other mode of the uh, profiling tool and figure out what to, why we've got this slow startup, uh, fix your problems, run these tests again, and then you should be good. So that's the automated testing. There's a whole bunch of manual tests as well. So that's on this next tab here. So I'll check that. And now here are all the manual tests. Uh, here we go. So the, uh, these are the manual ones. And these are done by people who do this testing uh, on your application. And there are 61 manual tests. So this is where you want to get your QA department to run through these and make sure that all of these are satisfied. Not all of them are applicable. There's a load of stuff in here. So yeah, sure, required app images. You need to have the um, uh, default tile image on the start screen is representative of the app. So they're going to pin your default tile and make sure it's, it, it's not the kind of the, the star one that you've forgotten to put a, a default tile image. Uh, and make sure that the, uh, the different tile images are representative of the app. So these are kind of uh, qualitative assessments, really. Um, you need to, it checks whether it will run on more than one Windows Phone device. Um, navigate through the app and then close. Ready, verify that unexpected behavior does not occur during the closure. So all of these things, these are things that can't be tested auto automatically. Uh, these are just going to have to be done by um, somebody running through these operations uh, and making sure that all these, are, all these requirements are met. 
Now, where these requirements have come from, there is in the, on the if you go on dev.windowsphone.store and search on there for the app certification requirements. These are all documented online. You need to read this anyway. But these are basically the manual tests that relate to those app certification requirements. And the back button, that's always a good one. Uh, most co common cause of failures when you submit an app, incorrect use of the back button, these guys. Back button must navigate back, basically, and it must close the app when, uh, when you're on the first screen. Uh, trial apps, there's phone calls, SMS and MS, MMS, a whole bunch of stuff. I'm not going to go through all of these. Uh, this is one that trips some people up. Technical support information you must supply on your app. A lot of people forget this. Verify that the app displays the app name, version information, and technical support contact information in a location that is easy to discover. You need an about page, people. Uh, so that one trips people up a lot. Um, toast notification opt-in. If you do toasts, you need to have the first time that the app calls the bind to shell toast method, you need to ask the user uh, this app wants to send you toasts. Are you okay about that? So all this stuff, you know, it's easy to forget. So check all this out. Uh, idle behavior under lock screen, minimum battery life, and so on and so forth. Now here's a load of music and video stuff. So obviously this will only apply if your application handles music and video. So not all of these are going to apply. So uh, you just need to read through them and make sure that the ones that do apply, you are, um, you're, you're conforming to the requirements that are associated. So there you go. Right, so now we have uh, built our app. Uh, you, by the way, I didn't say the, the zap file. I know this will come on this one. Is you'll find this if you drill down under the application after you've compiled it. You'll find it in the uh, in the slash uh, slash. Uh, bin slash debug or slash bin slash release, you need to submit the release build, you'll find the zap file in there. So distributing an app file, oh here we go, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. If you want to find your zap file, it is in the bin folder. Uh, uh, this In Windows Phone OS 7.1, the maximum size of a zap was 225 megs. For Windows Phone 8, this goes up to one gigabyte. You can have a zap that is one gigabyte. The reason why this is so much bigger is largely because of the new graphics, because of the higher resolutions. If you're including graphical assets in there, um, um, as we said, you know, you need to size them for the highest resolution, the WXGA. So they're going to be much, much bigger files. So that's one main reason for the uh, potential increased size of your zap. But Zap files will only be sent over the air, so over a cellular data connection, if they're uh, under 20 megs. So anything bigger than that, and the user can still buy it, obviously, from the store, but they'll get a message to saying, you need to complete, uh, you'll need, it says attention required, and you need to, combine, to com uh, connect to a Wi-Fi network, and then it will complete and download the rest of the, this, this outside Zap file for you. Yeah, you can share your Zap files. I showed you this when I installed the, uh, the uh, Windows Phone Toolkit sample application, uh, you, can, you can get your zap file and send it to other developers saying, hey, can you try this out, please? Uh, so that can be installed directly onto a developer unlocked device or onto an emulator by using this application deployment tool, which you get as part of the Windows Phone 8 SDK. So that's a good way of getting people to try it out and give you some feedback. Now, in Windows Phone 7.x, when, when you send a zap file, uh, when you compile a zap file, it compiles it to this byte code, which you then submit, uh, you then send that up to and deploy that to the store. Uh, and that byte code, if that's intercepted, um, it can easily be decompiled. So people can steal your uh, intellectual property by going and decompiling your code and figuring out what it is you've done, stealing your ideas. So it was a good thing to consider using obfuscation tools in Windows Phone 7.x. Uh, that's not really necessary anymore unless you're a... Uh, completely, uh, you know, if you've got very, very high security requirements, because now because we've got this compile in the cloud thing, what is being shipped from uh, the Windows Phone store over to a device uh, is native code anyway, it's, it's pre-compiled code. And the other thing is that the, uh, the, uh, the network connections between the store and, your, and the Windows Phone 8 phones uh, uh, are all uh, SSL, they're encrypted. Uh, the actual zap files themselves are, are transmitted over the network encrypted. So there's loads of layers of encryption and really you are probably going to be in good shape and unless it's a very, very high security application, uh, obfuscation is not, no longer required anymore. Right, so now we've packaged our solution. 
Now it's time to actually send it up there. Side loading. There is no side loading. You cannot side load apps um, onto, uh, onto a uh, consumer phone. Exception to that rule is enterprises who, um, who uh, have registered as, uh, as enterprises, um, uh, enterprise publishers who are publishing uh, their own applications. But even those have to be digitally signed with the enterprise's own digital signature and the phones that receive it have to be enrolled into that enterprise. And Rob will be talking about that a little bit later on. So there's no way you can send a zap and get it onto a locked phone. You, like I said with the previous tool that I showed you, the uh, application deployment tool, sure you can take a zap and install that onto a developer unlocked phone, subject to that limit of only 10, maximum of 10 at any one time. Uh, but uh, for normal consumer phones, the only way they can get apps onto their phone is by buying them from the store. So in order to uh, submit an application uh, for publication, for verification and publication, uh, you need to be registered with, uh, you need to have a registered Win uh, Windows Phone developer account. You need to go to dev.windowsphone.com and there you can sign up as a, as a publisher. Uh, for individuals, it's $99 per year. If you're a student, you can register for it on a program called DreamSpark, which allows you to register for free. Uh, and once you're registered, then you can submit applications for, uh, for verification and publishing. Well, how do you make money then? So you can, once you ship, uh, when you submit an application in for verification, you also have to set the price that you want to ask for this application. And you can choose to uh, have a paid app or you can choose to have your app free. Uh, or you can give it away free and then have in-app purchase to add value. So we talked about that one before. But let's assume now uh, it, it's just a simple buy. Uh, the, per the purchaser buys it at the point uh, when they first receive it you will get 70% of the price that they pay for that application. 30% uh, goes to Microsoft. This is consistent with, um, uh, with other suppliers in the industry. Um, once you have earned uh, $200 or more, then you will start receiving payments from Microsoft and the payments made by bank transfer. So you, are, uh, you can submit in your annual, it's a year, so you have to pay $99 per year. Uh, you, are, um, you can submit any number of paid applications in that year. Uh, you are limited to the number of free app submissions, and these are submissions, not actual public published apps. So if you send up, a, you send up an app for uh, verification, and it's a free app, and it fails, you'll get a failure report, and then you'll fix it, and you'll submit it again, and then it gets published. That's two submissions that you've used up. Uh, once you've hit your 100, 100 threshold, you can do additional free application submissions at an extra cost of $20 each time. So no limit to paid applications. Uh, there, is a, there is a limit on the number of paid apps any one developer can have certified in a single day, which is 20. And this was just because there are some shops out there who have these um, automated publishing uh, 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 programs where you can, they can easily spit out hundreds of apps in a day that all very subtle, subtly different. Um, there is a limit on that, and that has been imposed to uh, avoid flooding the market with uh, apps that are not sufficiently differentiated from each other. So it's a kind of trying to keep the quality of the apps in the store high. Um, and also the other thing is when, when bulk publishers flood the market like that, it means that sort of bona fide, well, bulk publishers are not, uh, not sort of uh, irregular anyway, but it's... Uh, other um, app publishers could kind of easily get sort of lost in the noise because of all these other new publications that uh, that come that are published at the same time. So yeah, apps can be free or paid, but there is this uh, trial mode is very very popular with people. Uh, people like the idea of being able to give an application a go, and if they like it, pay the money for the full application. So there is this trial mode. We kind of touched on that with the Contoso cookbook in the in the uh, in app payments, in that the uh, initially it was trial mode, which allowed you to get a feel for how the app worked, but some of the app content was blocked. Uh, so. The only limitation, the only kind of downside of having a trial mode uh, application is that a lot of people only go, they, if they're looking for an app, they'll go and look in the free app section first. People love free. Uh, but if you, uh, if, you can, if you have your app as a trial mode, sure, they don't have to pay any money to try it out, but it still will appear in the, the regular paid app section. 
So that's the only uh, disadvantage of this approach. But it has been shown to be a very successful way of getting people to try out your app and for, uh, for them upselling later on to get the full paid version. Uh, so the way you figure out if you're running in trial mode is this license information API. It has a method on it called isTrial. Just call that. Uh, if it comes back as true, you know you're running in trial mode. And then it's up to you to figure out what functionality you offer in trial mode uh, so you're blocking access to certain features. So this is how you do it. You have code littered through your app that's blocking access based on what this method returns. So yeah, in-app purchase, we, we touched on this, the durables and consumables, so I'm not going to say much more about it at this point. But it is a great way of uh, an, an alternative, a good way of uh, may, maybe selling your app as a free app or a very low initial purchase price, offering reduced functionality, and then to uh, upsell to your, uh, to your user to allow them to unlock additional functionality by uh, purchasing through in-app purchase. A uh, very, very effective way of, uh, of getting people to, to pay. When you submit your application for validation, the uh, Microsoft App Ingestion Service runs those tests that we sh saw in the store test kit. Um, and they're checking for the application uh, making is not using any capabilities uh, that they haven't asked for, uh, checks for any, uh, any disallowed APIs, and checks that all of the required uh, files have been supplied. And then they also do all this manual testing, uh, including the back button and dormant tombstone behavior and all that kind of good stuff. This takes a few days. Um, submission process is, uh, I think, uh, around about f up to five days. And you get back a testing report that you can use to fix the problems. So it gives you a lot of good information. And the good thing is, when you then fix those problems and resubmit, uh, they don't necessarily go through the whole process again. So they'll focus on the bits that failed before. Uh, and actually, they're very reasonable people. These are real people on the end of this process. And uh, they will give you uh, sort of quite direct feedback and uh, uh, on occasion, they have even had said things like, well, you, there's this, cap this feature, this requirement that you don't quite conform with, but we don't consider it serious enough to block publication. We're still going to allow publication, but you need to fix it on your next update. So uh, this is pretty reasonable, reasonable behavior. Now, if you want to then, uh, when you submit, more often than not, you will just check that uh, public store checkbox, the radio button there. But maybe you want to submit it for private beta testing. So what happens here is you check, you select that, that beta radio button, and then you have to enter some uh, Microsoft account email addresses. So, you know, it used to be, there'll be outlook.com or, or hotmail.com.co.uk or whatever uh, email addresses or live.com, and uh, you can send, they will receive invitation emails, and you can have up to 10,000 testers who will receive a deep link to the beta application. Now, what you're doing here is you're taking advantage of Microsoft's distribution networks. Uh, they get a link, and they can easily install your application onto a consumer-locked phone. Now, they are signed, when, when this happens, they are signed with a digital signature, which allows them to use it for up to 90 days. And then when that 90 days expires, that beta application just simply disappears off the phone. But while, they, while they've got it for that 90 days, they can test it and give you feedback. Now, as part of this beta submission, it doesn't go through any of the testing. So you're simply taking your app as is and using the uh, Windows Phone st Store distribution network to get that into the hands of your beta testers. To allow them to give you feedback and run it, check it on, in, a, in a real live situation uh, and to check out your app. Uh, the one thing about in-app purchase, like I mentioned before in the previous session, is that if you're running in beta mode, any in-app purchase items uh, don't involve any uh, monetary uh, uh, cost to anybody. So you really are just testing it without any uh, problems with uh, uh, any cost being incurred by your beta testers. You could also uh, you can submit it then through to the public store, but you can choose to have it as a private distribution. So this means your app does go through all the full testing. It gets verified and uh, eventually Microsoft, or hopefully first time, will say, yeah, your app is great and it's going to be distributed in the, uh, through the store. And uh, then uh, uh, normally if you, don't, uh, if you don't check that hide from users browsing or searching the store, then it will turn up in searches when people are in the Windows Phone Store app. 
But uh, if you check that, then users will not see this. They, they will, it will never turn up in searches. It's completely hidden. So this is a kind of a, a, a lightweight alternative to a full a private enterprise distribution if you don't want to go down that route. Um, but it's not completely secret, so anybody who gets hold of that deep link to that application would be able to uh, navigate to it and install it onto their phones. Right, lastly, uh, advertising SDK, yeah, how to get you some, uh, another way of getting in income. You can, you can actually have um, advertising in applications, and this has been a popular way of earning income. So you get uh, the advertising SDK, it's part of the, uh, the Windows Phone 8 SDK, and you, but you need to actually manually add the assembly to any project that wants to include adverts in it. And then all you do is you add, put this ad control into your application, add it into your UI, and the ad control will then uh, cycle ads that are selected by, from, uh, from advertisers who have subscribed to, uh, uh, to, to, my, to, to Microsoft, uh, to the uh, advertising center. And uh, anybody who clicks through on the advers advertisement to a website will get uh, will get the uh, uh, will get the uh, you you will earn money for every click through. You also get money for uh, for uh, impressions. So you get seventy percent of the revenue for that as well. This is the pub center where you sign up for this, and you get a an, a special ID that you embed into it. And pub center is now been expanded from uh, thirty six developer countries and it adds. Um, Another 17 with Windows Phone 8, and it's expanding all the time. Um, it's fair to mention there are third-party advertising uh, suppliers as well, so that, that isn't the only option. Right, finally, 10 tips on how to make more money out of uh, your application. I like tips to make money. Yep, that's right. Money, money, money. One, two. Firstly, trial API is very popular. You've got 70 times more downloads if you offer a trial version of your app than only a paid version. So this is something other platforms don't offer. So it, statistically, we found that people earn seven times more revenue this way. Secondly, use live tiles. People love live tiles. This is the feature that makes Windows Phone unique compared to the competitors. And if you look at the top 50 apps, they are 3.7 times more likely to have live tiles than, than uh, mm. less successful ones. Push notifications is another feature that people love. Again, the top 50 apps are 3.2 times more likely to have push notifications, so consider using that. Ad control with localization is a good way of earning income. And uh, uh, more local relevance drives higher impressions uh, for you, uh, earns you more income. The fifth way of uh, ensuring success is make sure you adopt the Windows Phone style. People don't like apps that are just copies of something from another platform, really obviously don't belong. They like stuff that uh, adopts the style and feels like it, it, it extends and enhances the phone, Windows Phone platform. And number six, publish globally. We've got over 180 countries now where, where Windows Phone apps can be sold. So uh, make sure you publish to as many countries of those as possible. Doesn't mean you have to ship in 180 languages, um, but do also think of localizing for the, the, there in, for different countries. Because uh, if you can offer a local language version, uh, your app could be number one in a certain territory, even if it maybe is not doing so quite well in others. So that's a really good way of getting, uh, getting uh, good attention for your app. Uh, right size your app. Uh, 90 megs for 7.1, uh, and it's uh, 150 for, uh, for Windows Phone 8 applications. Act on feedback. This is really important. So I, I think I'd really highly advise you to, on your About page, put some kind of a contact us link so you could uh, actually fire up the, uh, the email launcher task. So give people a chance to email you, give you feedback um, or, 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 or such and such because you don't want to have bad reviews. Bad reviews is what kills your app and as soon as people feel that, they are, that there's something they don't like about your app and they'll just, they just go in and slam it on the, in reviews, uh, that's really bad and people look at reviews and see whether they look at the star rating to see whether people like your app or not. And one way of getting good reviews is to make sure that your users can feel that they can reach out to you as the developer and pass on their feedback. They love that. Number 10, update frequently. The top 50 apps are updated every two to three months. People don't like the idea that an app has, you know, the developer has lost interest. They like to see new versions with a few little new features coming out. And they want to feel the love of this sort of thing. So those are the top 10 tips to make more money today. However, yeah, this is something new. actually there's the 11 top tips. Yeah, the 11 top tips to make more money today, and that is we don't do mediocre. 
Deliver no, we excellence. We hate mediocrity. No bugs. Use fast application switching. Fast application resume, I should say. Make an engaging experience for users. Go the extra mile to make your apps really stand up. So there are other things I haven't mentioned. Search extensibility, background agents are great. Wallet behaviors, customizable live tiles that are regularly updated. Um, and deep linking from tiles. These are all great fit ways of reaching out to your user and making your app more responsive to users. Um, and one of the key things really with Windows Phone is um, we haven't got as many apps as some of our competitors, but that is still an opportunity for you as developers because you've got a greater chance of standing out from the crowd rather than to release into a very, very crowded marketplace where uh, you could, even if you created a, created a great app, great, created a great app uh, you, could, you, could, you could be unlucky and not get noticed. Uh, that's not an excuse for saying you don't need to do good marketing. You do, absolutely. But if you, if you go out and great, create a great app, you, you've got a, a great opportunity. It's a growing market, Windows Phone. Uh, a lot of new markets opening up, and, uh, uh, and uh, you've got a great chance of, uh, of success. All right. So that is the store story. I'm sure there's going to be plenty of questions, oh, which, yeah. I'm gonna, yeah, which I'm going to go and switch on and to, yeah. Uh, yeah, Rob's smiling. I have here. a surface for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I'll do my best to answer some of them. But that's the store story. Um, we're now going to take a 10 minute break. And then when we come back, Rob is going to put his mobility uh, architect hat on. There Ding. we go. And he's going to give you the benefit of his vast experience in creating really great enterprise-scaled mobility applications. I'm excited. Yeah. See you soon.